a wild cat spotted in the background. Three people, hey! One less now, I just quit. Oh, that was Alex. He's an intellectual kitty. Yes. John wanted to show you a picture. Oh, John, okay. Show me the picture. Oh, four people. Wow. Oh, yay. Okay, all right, goodbye. Hello, four people, yay. Welcome to my Twitch channel. I'm calling this a cup of tea, a book, and me, Illuminani. <laughs> um, this is going to be just for fun um, to sit and listen to some good literature while you paint or decrease on screen time or read or knit or do whatever you want to do. Um, but have some fun chill time and listen to me read because I love reading out loud. So we are going to start with a short story by Ray Bradbury. Um, it's from his collection of I Sing the Body Electric. And I found this book in college. And it's one of the books that changed my life for the better. And I'm going to do the short story called The Man in the Rorschach Shirt. So here we go. Get to the page. All right. And we're off. Drinking a cup of tea first. The Man in the Rorschach Shirt by Ray Bradbury. Brokaw. What a name. Listen to it. Bark, growl, yip. Hear the bold proclamation of Emmanuel Brokaw. A fine name for the greatest psychiatrist who ever tread the waters of existence without capsizing. Toss a pepper-ground Freud casebook in the air and all students sneezed, Brokaw! Whatever happened to him? One day, like a high-class vaudeville act, he vanished. With the spotlight out, his miracle seemed in danger of reversal. Psychotic rabbits threatened to leap back into hats. Smokes were sucked back into loud powder gun muzzles. We all waited. Silence for ten years. And more silence. Brokaw was lost, as if he had thrown himself with shouts of laughter into mid-Atlantic. For what? To plumb for Moby Dick? To psychoanalyze that colorless fiend and see what he really had against mad Ahab? Who knows? I saw him running for a twilight plain, his wife and six Pomeranian dogs yapping far behind him on the dusky field. Goodbye forever! His happy cry seemed like a joke, but I found men flaking his gold leaf name from his office door next day, as his great fat women couches were hustled out into the raw weather towards some Third Avenue auction. So the giant, who had been Gandhi, Moses, Christ, Buddha, Freud, all layered in one incredible Armenian dessert, had dropped through a hole in the clouds. To die? To live in secret? Ten years later, I rode on a California bus along the lovely shores of Newport. The bus stopped. A man in his seventies bounced on, jingling silver into the coin box like manna. I glanced up from the rear of the bus and gasped. Brokaw! By the saints! And, with or without sanctification, there he stood, reared up like God-manifest, bearded, benevolent, pontifical, erudite, merry, accepting, forgiving, messianic, <laughs> tutorial forever and eternal, Emmanuel Brokaw. But not in a dark suit, no. Instead, as if they were vestments of some proud new church he wore, Bermuda shorts, black leather Mexican sandals, a Los Angeles Dodgers baseball cap, French sunglasses, and the shirt. Oh, God, the shirt. 
a wild thing, all lush creeper and live fry trap, fly trap undergrowth, all pop up dilation and contraction, full flowered and crammed at every interstice and crosshatch with mythological beasts and symbols. Open at the neck, this vast shirt hung wind whipped like a thousand flags from a parade of united but neurotic nations. But now, Dr. Brokaw tilted his baseball cap, lifted his French sunglasses to survey the empty bus seats. Striding slowly down the aisle, he wheeled, he paused, he lingered, now here, now there. He whispered, he murmured, now to this man, this woman, that child. I was about to cry out when I heard him say, well, what do you make of it? A small boy, stunned by the near circus poster effect of the old man's attire, blinked in need of nudging. The old man nudged. My shirt, boy, what do you see? Horses, the child blurted at last. Dancing horses. Bravo, the doctor beamed, patted him, and strode on. And you, sir? A young man, quite taken with the forthrightness of this invader from some summer world, said, why, clouds, of course. Cumulus or nimbus. Er, um, n not storm clouds, no, no. Fleecy, sheep clouds. Well done. The psychiatrist plunged on. Mademoiselle? Surfers. A teenage girl started, stared. They're waving. Big ones. Surfboards. Super. And so it went, on down the length of the bus, and as the great man progressed, a few scraps and titters of laughter sprang up, then, grown infectious, turned to roars of hilarity. By now, a dozen passengers had heard the first responses, and so fell in with the game. This woman saw skyscrapers. The doctor scowled at her suspiciously. The doctor winked. That man saw crossword puzzles. The doctor shook his head. This child found zebras, all optical illusion, on an African wild. The doctor slapped the animals and made them jump. This old woman saw vague atoms and misty eaves being driven from half-seen gardens. The doctor scooched in on her seat, scooched in on the seat with her a while. They talked in fierce, whispered elations, then up he jumped and forged on. Had the old woman seen an eviction? This young one saw the couple invited back in. Dogs, lightning, cats, cars, mushroom clouds, man-eating tiger lilies. Each person, each response brought greater outcries. We found ourselves all laughing together. This fine old man was a happening of nature, a caprice, God's rambunctious will, suing all our separateness up into one. Elephants, elevators, alarms, dooms. When he had bounded aboard, we had wanted not of each other. But now, like an immense snowfall, w which we must gossip on, or an electrical failure that blacked out two million homes, and so thrown us all together in communal chat, laugh, guffaw, we felt the tears clean up our souls, even as they clean down our cheeks. Each answer seemed funnier than the previous, and no one shouted louder than his great torments of laughter than this grand tall and marvelous physician who asked for, got, and cured us of our hairballs on the spot. Whales, kelps, grass meadows, lost cities, beauteous woman. He paused, he wheeled, he sat, he rose. He flapped his wildly colored shirt until at last he towered before me and said, sir, what do you find? Why, Dr. Brokaw, of course. The old man's laughter stopped as if he were shot. He seized his dark glasses off, then clapped them on and grabbed my shoulders as if to wrench me into focus. Simon Wenceslaus, is that you? <laughs> me, me, I laughed. Good grief, doctor, I read years ago. What's this you're up to? Up to? He squeezed and shook my hands and then pummeled my arms and cheeks gently. Then he snorted a great self-forgiving laugh as he gazed up and down along the acreage of ridiculous shirting. Up to, retired, swiftly gone. Overnight traveled 3,000 miles from where you last saw me. His peppermint breath warmed my face. 
and now best known hereabouts is, listen, the man in the Rorschach shirt. In the what? I cried. Rorschach shirt. Light as a carnival gas balloon, he touched into the seat beside me. I sat stunned and silent. We rode along by the blue sea under a bright summer sky. The doctor gazed ahead as if reading my thoughts in vast sky riding among the clouds. Why? You ask why? I see your face, startled at the airport years ago. My going away forever day. My plane should have been, should have been named the Happy Titanic. On it, I sank forever into the traceless sky. Yet here I am in the absolute flesh, yes? Not drunk, nor mad, nor riven by age and retirement's boredom. Where, what, why, how come? Yes, I said. Why did you retire with everything pitched for you? Skill, reputation, money. Not a breadth of scandal. None. Why then? Because this old camel had not one, but two humps broken by straws. Two amazing straws. Hump number one. He paused. He cast a sidelong glance from under his dark glasses. This is a confessional, I said. Mum's the word. Confessional, yes. Thanks. The bus hummed softly on the road. <clears throat> and my voice needs a cup of tea, pardon? <clears throat> Brokaw's voice rose and fell with the hum. You know my photographic memory? Blessed, cursed, with total recall. Anything said, seen, done, touched, heard, can be snapped back into focus by me, 40, 50, 60 years later. All, all of it, trapped in here. He stroked his temple lightly with the fingers of both hands. Hundreds of psychiatric cases delivered through my door, day after day, year on year, and never once did I check my notes on any of those sessions. I found, early on, I need only play back what I heard inside my head. Sound tapes, of course, were kept as a double check, but never listened to. There you have the stage set for the whole shocking business. One day, in my 60th year, a woman patient spoke a single word. I asked her to repeat it. Why? Suddenly, I had felt my semicircular canals shift as if some valves had opened upon cool, fresh air at a subterranean level. Best, she said. I thought you said beast, I said. Oh, no, doctor. Best. One word. One pebble dropped off the edge. And then, the avalanche. For distinctly... I had heard her claim he loved the beast in me, which is one kettle of sexual fish, eh? When, in reality, she had said he loved the best in me, which is quite another pan of co cold cod, you must agree. That night, I could not sleep. I smoked, I stared from windows, my head, my ears felt strangely clear, as if I had just gotten over a thirty years cold. I suspected myself, my past, my senses. So at three in the dead fall morning, I motored to my office and found the worst. The recalled conversations of hundreds of cases in my mind were not the same as those recorded on my tapes or typed out by my secretary's notes. You mean, you mean... I mean, when I heard beast, it was truly best. Dumb was really numb. Ox were cocks, and vice versa. I heard bed, and someone had said head. Sleep was creep, lay was day, pause was really P-A-U-S-E, pause. Rump was merely jump. Fiend was only leaned. Sex was hex, or mix, or God knows perplex. Yes, mess, no, slow, binge, hinge, wrong, long, side, hide, name a name, I'd heard it wrong. Ten million dozen misheard nouns. I panicked through my files. God grief, great jumping Josie, all those years, all those people, 
Holy Moses, Brokaw, I cried, all those years down from the mount, the word of God like a flea in your ear. And now, late in the day, old wise one, you think to consult your lightning scribbled stones, and you find your laws, your tables, different. Moses fled his offices that night. I ran in the dark, unraveling my despair. I trained to far rock away, perhaps because of its lamenting name. I walked by a tumult of waves, only equaled by the tumult in my breast. How, I cried, how can you have been half deaf for a lifetime and not known it? And known it only now when through some fluke the sense, the gift returned. How, how? My only answer was a great stroke of thunder wave upon the sands. So much for straw number one that broke hump number one of this odd-shaped camel. There was a moment of silence. Take a sip of tea. We rode swaying on the bus. The bus moved along the Golden Shore Road through a gentle breeze. Straw number two, I asked quietly at last. Dr. Brokaw held his French sunglasses up so sunlight struck fish glitters all about the cavern of the bus. We watched the swimming rainbow patterns, he with detachment and, at last, half-amused concern. Sight, vision, texture, detail. Aren't they miraculous? Awful in the sense of meaning true awe. What is sight, vision, insight? Do we really want to see the world? Oh yes, I cried promptly. A young man's unthinking answer. No, my dear boy, we do not. At twenty, yes, we think we wish to see, know, be all. So thought I once. But I have had weak eyes most of my life, spent half my days being fitted out with new specs by oculists, eh? Well, come the dawn of the corneal lens. At last I decided I will fit myself with those bright little teardrop miracles, those invisible discs. Coincidence? Psychosomatic cause and effect? For that same week I got my contact lenses was a week, was the week my hearing cleared up. There must be some physio-mental connection, but don't hazard me into an informed guess. All I know is I had my little crystal corneal lenses ground and installed upon my weak baby blue eyes and voila! There was the world. There were people. And God save us, there was the dirt and the multitudinous pores upon the people. Simon, he added, grieving gently, eyes shut for a moment behind his dark glasses. Have you ever thought, did you know, that people are, for the most part, pores? He let that sink in. I thought about it. Pores, I said at last. Pores. But who thinks of it? Who bothers to go look? But with my restored vision, I saw a thousand, a million, ten billion pores. Large, small, pale, crimson pores. Everyone and on everyone, people passing, people crowding buses, theaters, telephone booths, all poor and little substance, small pores on tiny women, big pores on monster men, or vice versa. Pores as numerous as that foul dust which slides pell-mell down church nave sunbeams late afternoon. Shh, Apollo, I'm reading. Pores. They became my utter and riven fascination. 
I stared at fine ladies' complexions, not their e eyes, mouth, or ear lobes. Should a man watch a woman's skeleton hinge and unhinge itself with that sweet pincushion flesh? Yes. But no, I saw only cheese grater kitchen sieve skins. All beauty turned sour grotesque. Swiveling my gaze was like swiveling the 200-inch Palomar telescope in my damned skull. Everywhere I looked, I saw the meat or bombarded moon in dread super close-up. Myself, God, shaving mornings was exquisite torture. I could not pluck my eyes from my lost battle pit and face. Damnation, Emmanuel Brokaw, I soft. You are the Grand Canyon at high noon, an orange with a billion navels, a pomegranate with a skin stripped off. In sum, my contact lenses had made me 15 years old again. That is, festering, self-crucified, bundle of doubt, horror, and absolute imperfection. The worst age in all one's life had returned to haunt me with its pimpled, bumpy ghost. I lay a sleepless wreck. Ugh, a second adolescence, take pity, I cried. How could I have been so blind so many years? Blind, yes, and knew it, and always said it was no of no importance. So I groped about the world as a lustful myope, nearsightedly missing the holes, rips, tears, and bumps on others as well as myself. Now reality had run me down in the street, and the reality was pores. I shut my eyes and went to bed for several days. Then I sat up in bed and proclaimed wide-eyed, Reality is not all. I refuse this knowledge. I legislate against pores. I accept instead those truths we intuit or make up to live by. I traded in my eyeballs. That is, I handed my corneal contact lenses to a sadist nephew who thrives on garbages and lumpy people and hairy things. I clapped back on my old undercorrected specs. I strolled through a world of returned and gentle mists. I saw enough, but not too much. I found half-discerned ghost peoples I could love again. I saw the me in the morning glass I could once more bed with, admire, and take as chum. I began to laugh each day with new happiness, softly, then very loud. What a joke, Simon, life is. From vanity we buy lenses that see all and so lose everything. And by giving up some small bit piece of so-called wisdom, reality, truth, we gain back an entirety of life. Who does not know this? Writers do. Intuitive novels are far more true than all your scribbled data fact reportage in the history of the world. But then at last I had to face the great twin fractures lying athwart my conscious. My eyes, my ears. Holy cow, I said softly. The thousand folk who tread my offices and creaked my couches and looked for echoes in my Delphic cave. Why, why preposterous. I had seen none of them, nor heard any clear. What was that, Mrs. Harbottle? What of old Dinismuir? What was the real color, look, size of Miss Grimes? Did Mrs. Scrapwright really resemble and speak like an Egyptian papyrus mummy fallen out of a rug at my desk? I could not even guess. Two thousand days of fog surrounded my lost children, mere voices calling, fading, gone. My God, I had wandered the marketplace with an invisible sign, blind and deaf, and people had rushed to fill my beggar's cup with coins and rushed off cured. Cured! Isn't that miraculous strange? Cured by an old ricket with one arm gone, as twere, and one leg missing. What? What did I say right to them out of hearing wrong? Who indeed were those people? I will never know. And then I thought 
There are a hundred psychiatrists about town who see and hear more clearly than I, but whose patients walk naked into high seas or leap off playground slides at midnight or truss women up and smoke cigars over them. So I had to face the irreducible fact of a successful career. The lame do not lead the lame, my reason cried. The blind and halt do not cure the halt and blind. But a voice from the far balcony of my soul replied with immense irony, Beeswax and bull, Durham. You, Emmanuel Brokaw, are a porcelain genius, which means cracked, but brilliant. Your occluded eyes see, your corked ears hear, your fractured sensibilities cure at some level below consciousness. Bravo. But no, I could not live with my imperfections. I could not understand nor tolerate this smug secret thing, which through screens and obfuscations played meadow doctor to the world and cured field beasts. I had several choices then. Put my corneal lenses back in, buy ear radios to help my rapidly improving sense of sound, and then find I had lost touch with my best and hidden mind, which had grown comfortably accustomed to thirty years of bad vision and lousy hearing. Chaos both for curer and cured. Stay blind and deaf and work. It seemed dreadful fraud, though my record was laundry fresh, pressed white and clean. So I retired packed my bags, and ran off into golden oblivion to let the incredible wax collect in my most terrible, strange ears. <clears throat> Tea break. We rode the bus along the shore. Oh, hold on. I wanted to read this. Oh. <laughs> That's a fun talk to, talk to text thing. <clears throat> anyway, back to the important stuff. We rode in the bus along the shore in the warm afternoon. A few clouds moved over the sun, shadows misted on the sands, and the people strewn on the sands under colored umbrellas. I cleared my throat. Will you ever return to practice again, doctor? I practice now. But you just said, oh, not officially. Not with an office or fees. No, never that again. The doctor laughed quietly. I am sore beset by the mystery anyway. That is, of how I cured all those people with a laying on of hands, even though my arms were chopped off at the elbows. Still, now, I do keep my hand in. How? With this shirt of mine. You saw. You heard. Coming down the aisle. Exactly. The colors. The patterns. One thing to that man, another to the girl, a third to the boy. Zebras, goats, lightnings, Egyptian amulets. What, what, what? I ask. An answer, an answer, an answer. The man in the Rorschach shirt. I have a dozen such shirts at home. All colors, all different pattern mixes. One was designed for me by Jackson Pollock before he died. I wear a sh each shirt for a day, or a week, if, go if the going, the answers, are thick, fast, full of excitement and reward. Then off with the old and on with the new. Ten billion glances, ten billion startled responds. Might I not market these Rorschach shirts to your psychoanalyst on vacation? Test your friends, shock your neighbors, titillate your wife. <laughs> No, no. This is my own special, private, most dear fun. No one must share it. Me and my shirts, the sun, the bus, and a thousand afternoons ahead. The beach waits, and on it, my people. So I walk the shores of this summer world. There is no winter here. Amazing, yes. No winter of discontent, it would seem, and a, and death a rumor beyond the dunes. 
I walk along in my own time and way, and come on, people, and let the wind flap my great sailcloth shirt, now veering north, south, or south by west, and watch their eyes pop, glide, leer, squint, and wonder. And when a certain person says a certain word about my ink-slashed cotton colors, I give pause. I chat. I walk with them a while. We peer into the great glass of the sea. I, sidewise, peer into their soul. Sometimes we stroll for hours, a longish session with the weather. Usually it takes but one day, and, not knowing with whom they walked, scot-free, they are discharged, all unwitting patients. They walk on down the dusky shore toward a fairer, brighter eve. Be behind their backs, the deaf-blind man waves them bon voyage and trots home there to devour suppers, brisk with fine work done. Or, sometimes, I meet some half-slumberer on the sand, whose troubles cannot all be fetched out to die in the raw light of one day. Then, as by accident, we collide a week later and walk by the tidal churn, doing what has always been done. We have our traveling confessional. For long before pent-up priests and whispers and repentances, friends walked, talked, listened, and in the listening talk cured each other's so sour despairs. Good friends trade hairballs all the time, give gifts of mutual dismays, and so are rid of them. Trash collects on lawns and in mines. With bright shirt and nail-tipped trash stick, I set out each dawn to clean up the beaches. <laughs> so many, oh, so many bodies lying out there in the light. So many minds lost in the dark. I try to walk among them all without stumbling. The wind blew through the bus window, cool and fresh, making a sea of ripples through the thoughtful old man's patterned shirt. The bus stopped. Dr. Brokaw suddenly saw where he was and leapt up. Wait! Everyone on the bus turned as if to watch the exit of a star performer. Everyone smiled. Dr. Brokaw pumped my hand and ran. At the far end, at the far front end of the bus, he turned, amazed at his own forgetfulness, lifted his dark glasses, and squinted at me with baby blue eyes. You! he said. Already to him I was a mist, a pointillist dream somewhere out beyond the rim of vision. You, he called into that fabulous cloud of existence which surrounded and pressed him warm and close. You never told me. What? What? He stood tall to display the incredible Rorschach shirt which fluttered and swarmed with ever-changing line and color. I looked. I blinked. I answered. A sunrise, I cried. The doctor reeled with this gentle, friendly blow. Are you sure it isn't a sunset, he called, cupping one hand to his ear. I looked and smiled. I hoped he saw my smile a thousand miles away within the bus. No, I said. A sunrise, a beautiful sunrise. He shut his eyes to digest the words. His great hands wandered along the shore of his wind-gentled shirt. He nodded. Then he opened his pale eyes, waved once, and stepped out into the world. The bus drove on. I looked back once. And there went Dr. Brokaw, advancing straight out and across a beach where lay a random sampling of the world, a thousand bathers in a warm light. He seemed to tread lightly upon a water of people. The last I saw of him, he was still gloriously afloat. <laughs> that is one of my favorites. <laughs> um, I was going to do two, but my voice is kind of tired and I haven't eaten dinner yet. So I think I'm going to call that the end of the stream for now. Thank you to everyone who is watching. I had so much fun. <laughs> I hope you guys had a lot of fun too. And um, 
yeah, uh, I'll try to do it again, probably around the same time, 4.30, 5-ish. 